lot of the drivers have a background in illegal street racing. It's all just part of a youth culture. As the culture has moved on, they've also wanted to compete at more and more of a higher level against better and better racers. The street racers are actually moving off the streets and onto tracks and organized events. Need for Speed Pro Street is the latest version in the long line of Need for Speed games. This game is focusing on an upcoming evolution of street racing where it's becoming more legitimized. The street racers are actually moving off the streets and onto tracks and organized events. Historically, Need for Speed has been influenced heavily by illegal street racing. And that's where the history of the game comes from, that's where the racing comes from, that's where the culture comes from inside this game. 99% of the guys that are racing in this culture came from the street. They had some fast street car, and they wanted to go faster, and they wanted to do all this stuff, but then they realized that, hey, this is dangerous if I take it out in the street. This whole industry was born from street racing and from that illicit you know, illegal activity of running out at night on the streets and it built a complete industry out of it. So a lot of the inspiration from our game has come from, you know, the, the excitement and the energy around drift racing. The fact that muscle cars have come back in a way we hadn't expected in the last couple years the import tuner drag scene, and also the new forms of grip racing that are coming out from the tuner scene. Import drag racing is a rebirth of the original 50s and 60s hot rod era, but with a modern twist. Fuel injected cars that you can get good gas mileage on and control them, but still drive them on the streets and still make outrageous horsepower. It's really the foundation of this import or tuning culture. Somewhere in the mid-90s, all these uh, import cars became really, really cool. In terms of the history of the sport, if you look at the most famous makes and models, the Honda Civic was the car of choice, and there's an entire aftermarket industry devoted just to this vehicle. You know, when I drag raced, there's nothing like that seven seconds. We're hammering down that track from zero to 200 mile an hour in seven seconds. You're basically fighting for your life going down the track. And, you know, you've only got a few feet on each side and you've got a car that's blazing. The tires are just on fire. It doesn't want to go straight. It wants to go right. It wants to go left. I mean, I've tried jumping out of airplanes. I've tried everything to get that rush. And there is nothing that comes close to that. It's just awesome. Definition of drifting, it's best said that the car looks like it's out of control, but it's on the edge of control at all times. It's not about checkered flags, it's not about finish line. It's not even about who the fastest is. Based on four criteria, speed, angle, line, overall excitement, coming fast, coming sideways, coming, throwing smoke, and you get the crowd hype, you get the judges hype, you're going to move on. The runs are very short, probably you run about 30 seconds. You know, you're holding on, you, you foot to the floor, there's tire smoke, the smell. It's just the adrenaline buzz of that really it makes it so exciting. When you start the Suiso or tandem bout, two cars drifting together side by side, and that's when it's really, really exciting. One car will lead first, and the second car's job is basically to follow as tight to that car and follow that car's line and demonstrate dominance and try to intimidate them into making a mistake. You got crashes, you have engines screaming, the smell of tire smoke, and it's just non-stop. Pretty much if you're breathing, you can't keep your eyes off it. For uh, 
Uh, someone who's unfamiliar with racing, grip racing is actually the anathema of drift racing. The focus is to go around the track as quickly as possible without losing traction. With drifting, it's not necessarily about how fast you go, it's how well you look when you're keeping the car at the edge of control. Grip racing is more about control. Frankly, it's a blast. You know, you, you get speed in grip driving that you never get when you're drifting. Drag racing is a super adrenaline rush that gives you a quick burst. Road racing will take that burst and will extend it over a longer period of time and kind of triple it out to you. The major grip racing event is called Time Attack, which is the uh, fastest lap around the racetrack wins. Time trialing is really guys building badass road race cars and seeing how fast they can get the car around the track by themselves. They're all on track at the same time, but they're not racing against each other like in a normal racing sense. They're actually out just battling against the clock. And that's it, simple as. They absolutely have to squeeze 100% out of the car in that short amount of time. The tires only need to last a couple laps. The driver only needs to last a couple laps. It gets the driver to drive way over the car's natural abilities, jumping curbs and, and much more violent form of road course racing. Brutal on machines, on drivers. It's the real test. If you were to take grip and drift and drag racing, they are part of a larger movement in terms of this whole sport compact tuner culture that we have. You know, they see these gutted roll cage 886 Corollas with wide wheels and stretched tires. They see all these crazy looking S13s and S14s. You know, they're thinking, hey man, I drive that same kind of car. I can make my car look like that. I think that's definitely one of the uh, appealing factors for this culture. There's a lot of excitement around these kids coming out and taking over these environments. And they're not making your traditional race weekend, your traditional motorsport event. It's becoming a festival about cars, about youth culture, about what's cool and what they're interested in. There's not a second of it that isn't fun because there's so many cool people that come out and do these events. It's just, it's great to be a part of the whole thing. Cars, women, this is great. Woohoo! I myself have participated in illicit street race. Wait a second. Past. It's Don't true. Don't it's say true. that out loud. It's true. And you know, I'm not really proud of the fact. Ouch. But but mom's gonna hear this, you know. Well, she probably knew anyhow. I think we took her to the races several times in Brooklyn. I'm sure most people start on the street because it's the cool, it's simple, it's let me go hang out with my guys and do some car related stuff. Drifting was really, really popular in Japan when it was right at its peak. I would just go watch, like 13, 14 years old. The day I turned 16, I got a 91 Honda Civic. Took my driver's test, got my license, went to my buddy's house, lowered it that same day, um, <laughs> went out to the street races in Long Beach that same night. Everyone we meet, all the drivers, most of them come from a street racing past. They have stories they'll tell you about some illegal run they did down a highway or one of their best drag races they did out in the street. Everywhere we went was a race. You go somewhere, it was a race to get home, race to get to the track, anything. So a lot of times we broke our cars on the way, up or back, you know, because we were running the engine so hard. We would do this thing called the figure eights. We basically have these off ramps in this highway that was configured like a big figure eight. One guy would go first and the other guy would follow. Whoever comes back first is the winner. I used to be a valet for like a nicer higher end hotel. So they had a lot of nice high end cars that used to come in. I take it out, kind of do a little test drive, Porsches and stuff like that. Blast through the whole three sideways, just smoking up the whole street. I got a car, got into it on the little amateur spots like parking lots. Once I got a little better, 17, 18 years old, I started going in the line with all the Japanese guys in the pretty hardcore spots. And somebody came up with this thing called mirror tag, you know? You're on the expressway and all of a sudden you just hear this boom! And somebody comes and just hits their mirror on your mirror. And this is, the, I'm talking like going really fast. So you don't even expect it. You're just kind of like about to fall asleep on the way home. You're driving, next thing you know, it's like bam! Sometimes a mirror will break. We 
made mistakes back in the days where uh, I got carried away with racing and I end up getting busted for it. It's not that the guys who do it are wanting to break the law. They just don't have enough places to race at and they have nowhere to go. When I was 17 years old, at that time, there was nowhere to race my car. You know, there was no tracks around. We'd go to the canyons sometimes and go, you know, speed through the canyons. We'd go to street races and go drag racing. At the time, racetracks wouldn't let us do it on their tracks. They're like, no way. Wouldn't even give us a parking lot. So, just like skateboarding, if there's not a skate park, we're gonna go, you know, do a 50-50 grind on your memorial. And it's just, you know, something that happens because of passion and love. We're men and we need to go do things, period. I have to admit, sometimes I am tempted to drift on the streets, even today as a pro. When you're driving down the freeway, you see an on-ramp that says uh, 30 miles an hour or 25 miles an hour. I mean, you're thinking, 30 miles an hour? I can take that at 60 if I was sideways. I'm not hurting nobody. I'm not robbing anybody. I mean, yeah, I'm breaking traffic laws, but to me, I, I don't feel that I'm, I'm doing bad to anyone. So yeah, you know, I got caught, whatever, but I've gotten away more times than I've gotten caught, so I'm still, I'm still ahead of the game, you know? I think street racing is a bit of a joke, really. It's just a bunch of kids going mental. Which is kind of cool, but everyone grows out of it eventually. People who think they're street racers are just really sort of clowns most of the time. It is just dangerous. You know, I hit another car before coming the other way. We were okay, he was okay too, but you know, there's a lot of accidents that happen. I watched the car in front of me go about halfway down, lose control, and just demolish the car. So after seeing something like that, I was like, you know, that could have been me in that car. The way our thing's going right now, basically the cops will pull any Honda right now, even if it looks stock. That's how hot the streets are right now with with Hondas or any imports right now. If you get hooked, if you if you think you like this, like this is something that I would like to do, then the street is nowhere for you. You can't really go on fast on the street. You can't drive fast on the street. You risk having your car taken away. You risk killing people. You know, it really doesn't make any sense. Operation Speeding Ticket was created in conjunction with our partnership with Irwindale Speedway. We were trying to think of a way to enhance exposure to the legal venue. Officers go out with a ticket book that looks just like a citation, and it's a $20 voucher to come race here any Thursday night. It's a street legal program where anybody can bring their car out to our property. We'll do a safety tech on it, we we'll pass the safety tech. You can uh, come out and run your car up and down the drag strip all night long. If you have a driver's license and it's your mom's grocery getter or, you know, anything that has a motor and it's legal to run on the strip, you can run it. If you look at it on any given day, it doesn't look like much. It's just this little, little strip of pavement with a tiny grandstand off to the side of a parking lot. But on Thursday nights when they have their drag racing events, it completely transforms the place where you just have Literally hundreds of cars come in there. We're usually averaging about 250 race cars every Thursday night, and depending on the weather, you're gonna get a couple thousand spectators here. That's legal street racing. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. The transition going from a street racing to a pro for us is pretty natural just because you get kind of worn out with going to the street races and you know, where's it end? I went through a lot of, through court and community service and fines and all. And I got realizing, you know, it's actually a lot safer here at the tracks than, than it is on the street. You're totally limited with your capabilities at the street races. You don't, there's no clocks, there's no timers. You don't really know if you're progressing. You know that you beat that guy or you lost, but you don't really know how fast your car is, if you're getting any better. We know that we're not going to put an end to street racing completely. We're not going to abolish it. The one thing that I can say personally that I know firsthand is I used to street race. I used to be out there and doing the same thing they were. But I, I've also seen accidents. I've seen people killed while street racing. I like doing a lot of different automotive shows and different events where I can actually sit and spend a lot of time talking with the kids coming up. They've got to hear from somebody like me who's been there and done that. that 
hey, that's, that's not the way to do it. Somebody's gonna get hurt. It's just a matter of time. It's not an if, it's a when. When you're actually out on the track, you're actually drag racing for time, you know, when you're grip racing for time, you know, like drift competition, you can actually see and push yourself a lot further and uh, see a lot more results. If you like this, you need to go onto a racetrack. You need to get professional. You need to step it up a bit. And that's where you'll truly experience fun and what you were looking for. And you guys should come out to the racetrack and do this for real is what it really boils down to. If you look at this entire tuning scene, everything comes from Japan. All the trends start in Japan. Everything in terms of the technology, in terms of the manufacturing, comes from the Japanese manufacturers. In the early 70s, there was these street tribes, and they called them Bosozoku. They were kind of looked upon as the guys that make the trouble. They're out there you know, racing or drifting or making a lot of noise in the streets. They were drag racing those cars, even back in the 70s and 80s, but they weren't import cars to them. To them, those are their domestic muscle cars, the old Corollas and Skylines and Datsun 510s and 240Zs. It developed again in the, in the early 80s. The tuner shops would bring their cars out on Friday nights to the areas. Um, Daikoku, which is uh, Rainbow Bridge in Tokyo, which is the center of the Wangan events. And they timed themselves going around the highway loop, and they just run in the middle of the night. Going up to the toge or mountain passes, people would just start, you know, the winding roads, that's where they would start to go before there were any organized events. You'll see in Japan, there's some big teams that will have like 10 cars running in a row, try to get as close as possible, you know. It's more organized street drifting, it's not just, you know, drifting through the middle of a city. There's places, there's rules, there's etiquette. You know, there's signals, you use all your lights and hazards and blinkers. And the futo is the industrial areas, the ocean, the docks, it's just like one big turn or two big turns connected. But it's really, really wide. They'll probably use like four lanes, they'll manji it all the way down. Basically, doing a drift down a straightaway, acting like there's corners there. A lot of the places that don't have spaces or a lot of corners, if you have a wide enough straightaway, you could do it. We've been driving toge for a while, race around for a while. But after that, we started going to tracks because they had events, track days, um, contests. The largest pro series and the main pro series is the D1 Grand Prix. Um, that has the best drifters in the world competing in it. Drifting, obviously, it started in the hills of Japan. Um, you know, there, there were people that had the foresight to turn it into a series in Japan. And then it came stateside. Import drag racing sort of started as a spawn of traditional drag racing. Kids saw other people drag racing, you know, IROX American cars. Well, they wanted to do that, but all they had was a hand-me-down Honda Accord and Civics. They were looking for a place to race, and a lot of the drag strips in Southern California at the time were very pro V8. We went to racetracks to try and do it legitimately, and we were told not to come back. Back then, there was no tag to what we were. The V8 guys used to call us rice rockets. We used to have people throw beer at us. You know, the, the domestic guys throwing beer like they didn't at want us when to we were testing track. our cars. Jab scrap throwing beer at us and stuff. And so a lot of the young people took to street racing, illegal street racing. This is Maria Street, bordering Compton and Long Beach. On any given night on a Saturday or Sunday, and this was pretty much the hangout. Right here, as you see, this is the starting line uh, with all the burnouts. It was like a cat and mouse game. When, it, when it's a bust here, there everyone knows to go to the next one. And after that, it just goes the whole night. And sometimes you could race out till the sun comes up. At the time, that's what you did. You went and drag raced. It wasn't necessarily just about the racing. It was about that culture, the scene, the hanging out with friends. You know, it's Friday night, it's Saturday night, or whatever it was. Let's go meet up. Let's go to the street races. It is like our nirvana. There's a street in Brooklyn and you got to know how to get there and it's in the middle of nowhere and when you just turn this one corner and it just opens up and there there's hundreds of cars and bikes. Hundreds and of cars. A lot of these street racing spots are not new spots. 
They've been around for 20, 30 plus years. The hot rod guys were racing out there, you know, long before we were. We just started kind of taking over, I guess. We had it organized, but everybody started coming in here. There was this casualty that happened here, and um, there needed to be a system where it, it could be done at a professional race track. And it was those kind of things that made the import scene decide to make a change. And again, that's, that's kind of where Frank Choi came up with the idea to do the first battle of the import. The first event was in, in 1990. Guys came in, everybody brought their stuff. It didn't matter if you were rear wheel drive, all wheel drive, front wheel drive, everybody was lumped in together. But it really made this people see what the potential was. He did one once a year and it was huge. They would have tens of thousands of people show up. It was just our team and our, and our group of people. It was fantastic. In the mid to late 90s, people in the USA first started to be aware of drifting. Um, and the scene in Japan. There was a small group of people who would buy these drifting DVDs and drift videos and they would watch them and try to mimic the moves. They actually had a lot of drift competitions and mountain runs and stuff that they actually showcased videos. When I first saw it, I was like, dude, this is dope. Like when you actually slide in a car all the way through instead of like gripping through. It's a whole different style of driving that's cool. There were pockets of guys, very exclusive guys, that was drifting, they pretty much did it in a very local underground manner. Drifters didn't get much respect from the from the racing community. You know, as much as we tried to get on the racetrack, it took years and years for us to be able to rent the tracks and, and get legal venues to run on. When it first became big and where it was widely recognized when we, was when we did the Falcon Drift Show in 2003. Jim Lau and Ryan Sage were the first ones to bring the D1 GP organized Japanese drifting to uh, Irwindale Speedway. Now it's known as the House of Drift. They eventually branched off and started Formula D, which is the top North American series now. The philosophy of Formula Drift is pretty simple. You know, we want people to come out and see something that they haven't really seen before. A sport that's coming up out of basically nowhere and growing into something that's really exciting for fans and also for competitors. I think people see that passion, and that's kind of what we shoot for. The scene in Europe right now is kind of like what the scene was like in Southern California in 2000. It's very young, very new and exciting to them, and I think it's, it's awesome. Drifting started first because a few years ago, that, that, kind of, that phenomenon kind of just boomed out of nowhere. We've got a lot of these Japanese cars now uh, that have been imported directly from Japan. Our regulations are different from, say, for instance, North America, where it's very difficult to have those cars. So it was very easy for us to start a series here, very similar to what was going on in Japan. Northern Europe, Scandinavia, they, they already have their own series now called Nordic Drifting Series. They also have a King of Europe, a whole European series. So there's several different series popping out right now. They're trying to come together and there's a lot of talent drivers. Europeans can definitely beat the top Japanese drifters. There's no reason why any of the drivers who are on the same level can't go over there and beat the Japanese. It's just a matter of right day, right time, right equipment. North American guys have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. And the same thing with the European guys. The Japanese guys look at North America and they look at Europe with a little bit of a little bit of an elitist view. Where they feel like we're better than you guys, we started everything. The Americans and the Europeans are catching up, taking tremendous strides. If you look at drifting, time attack, drag racing, the Americans have surpassed the Japanese in fact. It's growing by leaps and bounds. We've heard of uh, events as far as the uh, Virgin Islands, Australia is doing a lot of events. So it's, it's moving quite, quite around the world right now.
all these changes we're seeing into the different forms of racing are part of a movement inside of the racing culture in general. These guys don't want to risk it all out on the streets anymore. They want a new place to compete against the very best cars and the very best drivers where they can push themselves and their equipment to the ultimate level of competition. Drifting and import drag, it came from the streets. It's something that was never necessarily meant to be a big organized event like what we have now, but uh, you know, the kids took it and ran with it. One of the first thing you'll notice when you go to one of these events is that the crowd themselves are very different. It's not the same motorsport crowd. This is very much the street racer scene. It's not just about the cars and the racing. There's a lot more going on as well. From a spectator point of view, you know, full throttle runs, stuff like that will make the crowd go bananas. You can have a grassroots guy go up against factory back team, David Burks Goliath. Yeah, that's what really makes the fans stand up and yell. My nickname became the Crazy Swede, and I think it came out of the always trying to give the fans the little extra. When we pop in there and introduce ourselves, I pop a 360 in 67 miles per hour, grabbing the steering with one hand and let the doors open. And they love it. To actually see them thundering around the track, you know, and not one of them I don't think is under four or five hundred horsepower. When you get a pack, it's amazing, just the noise and everything else. It's really intense. A perfect example of something that really works is, is when they bring together the drag racing, the drifting, and like these car shows together in one venue. We're seeing a trend of these mega events that incorporate a lot of different elements. There's grip and drift and drag all at one event. And it's great for the fans because they can experience all these different events. One minute, you know, there's a car coming down 100 mile an hour sideways and 30 feet of tire smoke coming out the back of it. And then the next minute, there's a 900 horsepower Evo coming thundering down. Everyone goes away with a smile on their face because they get to see something that they didn't really bargain on. You've got 15,000 plus people that all have similar interests all at one spot all doing what they're passionate about. Almost like a three ring circus type of atmosphere where there's a car show in one area and there's jello wrestling in another area and bikini show. The sex appeal of the girls, all the models, the umbrella girls, like the Falcon girls are, you know, some of the hottest yet most down to earth models out there, you know. There's like all sorts of people lining up to get autographs from these girls. It's definitely a part of the, the culture. It's definitely part of the appeal of the event. At all our types of events, we encourage the fans into our pits, into the staging lanes, into places where they can learn and get involved. I think that really allows them to feel like they're part of it a lot more so. The, the crowds are great, they come around and support us, they're dying to get into the pits all the time and ask you questions. It's what it's all about and, and it's crowd pleasing that's going to let this continue. Drifting, import drag racing and grip racing are all part of a larger culture and lifestyle. It's really youth automotive culture. The fan base are linked to the new generation of MTV and hip hop and you know, indie rock culture. The show is all about their lifestyle come to life, so to speak. So it's the cars they drive actually out on a track, drifting and driving in time attack and drag racing. We have our own voice, our own language that we speak when we're within the confines of our peers and hanging out and having fun. You could break our culture down into action sports, art, music, fashion, and cars. Done.
I do what I do because we're the luckiest people to be able to do what we do. Some people look at me like I'm a nutcase. I mean, I'm building a 2,000 horsepower streetcar for myself because a 1,000 wasn't enough. Yeah, I got props, okay? Yeah, I guess I am a thrill seeker. Before drifting, all I did was skate, surf, ride bikes, probably the adrenaline rush, you know? I, I love it. A lot of these guys are grandstanders, you know? They, they really want to show off. The opportunity to show off in front of a national, international audience is much more appealing than winning in front of a couple hundred people at midnight on a Friday night in some industrial area. Professional racing is a higher form of a bragging rights and the biggest reward is that final cup to win the whole series. It gets pretty heated. They'll never admit it, but you'll see the guys go back and forth between each other where there's no love lost between them once they get on the track. If you and I line up, it's on. And you know, we're going to battle. You might be my boy, but when we line up, we're, we're arch enemies. And I'm doing everything to lop your head off with my sickle at the light. And then, I'm not going to go to the next one. I'm 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 going to go to the next one. You know, when I get in the car, you know, I kind of start being more aggressive. I'm not yelling at myself in the car or yelling at them and getting heated. Everybody's like enemies, you know. That's kind of how I get excited and pumped and more competitive edge. That's probably one of the hardest things in the big show. They're still my friend until we get to the starting line. I wouldn't identify myself as a competitive person, to be honest with you, but I guess I am. To drive, to do this, to win, it's almost like it's part of our core being. The allure is added exposure, sponsorship, money that will enable you to keep going and going faster, which is what you want to do. To be honest, the competitors don't really look at it as winning a national championship and winning in these accolades, but they look at it as beating the other guy, but there's just so much more pressure because there's so many more eyeballs on them. It's no longer show up, hey, who cares, just go for it. It's really focus. Mindset is everything. We have 60 good drivers on every given weekend, and any given weekend, those drivers can win. The most intense part of drag racing has got to be when you're at the line and you're waiting for the, the lights to drop. There's a lot of uh, anxiety that happens at that, that moment. I try to stay relaxed. I do this because I enjoy it, not for any other reason. I do it for any other reasons, just to kid myself. I'm here purely to have fun. So to get stressed, to just ruin it. I started to do kind of zen breathing techniques, which keeps my mind focused on just breathing. You get all these other second guessing thoughts out of your head. I don't think there's any fear involved with what I do. You know, what if I hit the wall? What if I do this? What if I do that? I, don't, I can't really think about the what ifs because I start to panic and then I won't be able to drive. So, If you're scared, go to church. You know, you shouldn't be doing this stuff. I, I just like playing with other people's heads because I'm, I'm not a big believer in luck. I have a voodoo stick I keep in my car. When I'm at the line with people, like some of the, the big baller drivers, you know, I'll bust out the voodoo stick and they just get kind of weirded out like, is this fool trying to do voodoo? Like, what is this guy doing? This is our lifestyle. This is what it's all about. This is why we spend hours and evenings and weekends and through the night trying to make these cars, is to come and do this kind of thing. And for me, that still burns really deeply inside that this is what we want to do. It's not just coming to the track and just driving at the event and going back home and that's it. Like, it's a lifestyle. Like, you go home, you're thinking about what you want to do next to your car, and you're improving your own driving, practice and do demos, and just kind of keep building skill level up. It's just something that I'm passionate about and I love, and I'll do whether I'm getting paid or not. We're starting to see a lot of drivers switch disciplines. We have an import drag racing icon that switched to drifting, a rally champion that switched to drifting. You have drifting champions that have switched to time attack. They're going back and forth, and I think uh, what a lot of people are trying to do now is uh, to really hone their, their car control skills and uh, you know become an, a good all-around driver. It's a little tricky to go back and forth between time attack and drifting. Even if I'm in a yellow Z time attack, I need to remember as I'm coming into a corner, you know, your third eye kind of sees this beautiful drift potential link through these corners on the time attack, tracking like, oh my God, this would be so awesome. I'd be in fourth gear drifting through this. And you just have to say no. <laughs>
If I'm drag racing or drifting, I probably view the competition not as the enemy, but as the obstacle that I'm competing against. I'm assuming that they're gonna do well, and I need to do better than they're gonna do. We're just a, a bunch of young, crazy cats out here, bringing some horsepower to burn the tires and go faster on the track. Whether it's a straight line, sideways, or just making a turn. The cars that exist in our element right now are very much an extension of the people who own them. You could tell a lot about a person by the type of car that he drives. Style in the cars is huge for me. Yeah, we obviously just want to go out there and, and go really fast and hopefully try to win, but we want to look good while we're doing it too. People won't come and watch beat up banger racing, you know. It's got to be smart looking cars. People have got to look at them and go, wow, cool. In America, I would say it's Honda first, Nissans, Toyotas are, are right there. Japan, for drift, drag, and grip, there's only really a handful of cars. Nissan, Mazda, Toyota. The two biggest cars in drifting are a early 90s Nissan 240SX and a late 80s Toyota Corolla. And believe it or not, those are the best chassis. They're most neutral, most easiest to, to come by. Well, this is my car. This is a good example of an AE86 Sprinter Trueno in the USA. It's called the AE86 Corolla GTS. It's the last rear-wheel drive Toyota Corolla. These are what are called Tomodachi stickers, and um, in Japan, Tomodachi stickers are something that the drift teams give to their friends. So each crew has a sticker. Putting these stickers on your car means that, hey, these are the drift teams I'm friends with. This is a Nissan S13. The American version, left-hand drive. We got a 2.0 full race manifold, 3071 turbine, AME wheels. I mean, this car is awesome. This is Skyline GTR. The signal was built by the drift team. It 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 was built by the drift team. My car is a 1990 Toyota Chaser. I've always had funky cars, and to be honest, I don't like having the same car as everyone else. And for me, that's a big six cylinder kind of barge and I like it. Lower the car as much as you can, loud muffler, the car slammed, it just looks cool, you know. That's the basic drift style. If you've got the wheels sticking out from the fenders, the fenders are basically sitting on the tire, you know. If you go into something like a time attack, the two biggest cars right now are the all-wheel drive cars, the Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution and the Subaru WRX STI. Awesome platforms to start off with, handle phenomenal, and are just really easy to work on and friendly to, to modify. And you can pick them up pretty cheap, you know, 20 odd grand, you get yourself a 400 horsepower, all wheel drive car. I mean, that's tough to beat, and those cars are instantly fast if you know how to control them. You'll see Subarus out here with 700 horsepower, Zs with 650 horsepower, just fighting their way around a track. Cars that you see out on the street that tuning shops have built up into basically race cars, and they are insane. I started running Time Attack with this car here off the showroom floor stock. I mean, stock tires, brakes, suspension, and the car's evolved over the last year to what it is now. I do 10 drag races a year and around eight road races. When I drag race, my car is a ruthless weapon and I exert force on it, and when I exert force on it, metal fatigues and it goes very fast. You know, if we could have gone back 10 years and taken a look what we're doing now, we'd go, no way, there's no way that's gonna work, dude. Look at that thing, the turbo's that big. Tires are this big, it's on the front. We're doing it. We talk about import tuning, it's not import tuning anymore, it's sport compact tuning because you have the American makes, Chevy, you know, you have Mopar out there. So it's, it's evolved by leaps and bounds. When American cars first started popping up on the sport compact scene, a lot of people, myself included, were just rolling our eyes like, oh God, it's so lame. But now you have you know, all these uh, new cars coming out, all the, the Mustangs and especially the new Camaro, that thing's badass. And the drivers who drive those cars are some of the top drivers in the sport, so they're proving that you could drift with just about anything. Here's my Ford Mustang, five liter Hasselgren built, 
690 horsepower motor. It's got a four-speed dog box, exity clutch. You can see the huge k and filter. The Mustang is a real-wheel drive. It's got a lot of torque, a lot of power. Of course, it's an American icon, so. It was a tough decision, you know, do I get out of this nice little nimble car and get in this big heavy monster to compete with, you know, mainly Japanese-based cars. It was just something that I really was up for the challenge. There's nothing like that V8 screaming. The fans love it. I love it from the cockpit. Drifting is very unique because of the fact that we have, uh, you know, Nissan 240s competing against Ford, race, uh, Ford, Ford Mustangs. European, American, Japanese. I like all kinds of cars. Now that they're bringing the domestic side in, they're bringing this whole new breed of cars that the Japanese guys don't see. So now all the Japanese guys are interested in the American cars like, wow, they can get that to drift? Like, who knew, you know? So it's cool. I think a young person who wants to start out and get into the scene, you got to start with a cheap car, um, an inexpensive car that has inexpensive parts, something that's easy to fix. Start off with the lower horsepower cars, such as a Corolla. You learn the most basic fundamentals of drifting in the lower horsepower car anyway, so I think anyone who can master a Corolla can drive any other car out there. You just go out there and have a go, take plenty of tires and have a play, because it's all about knowing your car, knowing what's going to happen, and you can only learn that through experience. When you go to the racetrack, I mean, you don't have to be intimidated. You go out there with your car, with your street tires, at your pace. It's at your pace. It's not at anyone else's pace. So it's literally as fast as you want to go and as competitive as you want to be, it's up to you. You can even compare it to video games. It's like getting a new video game, knowing that you want to be the first one to get to the end or pass a certain level or whatever it is and compete with your friends. And just totally being in focus of that situation it takes you into a different world, you know, and, and you're in more control in that world. I think in terms of uh, where Need for Speed is taking the franchise with Pro Street, they're right on the money with it because they're moving into more of the high-level events as opposed to the illicit, illegal, nighttime, drifting, time attack, street racing type of elements. Need for Speed Pro Street allows the player to play some of the most aspirational cars inside of the street racing scene, build them out the way they want, create the car that they want to drive, and then go and race them all around the world. You're seeing the more glamorous cars, the more glamorous driving scenarios, the tracks, the cars drifting around tracks at speed. Honestly, I was tripping out at how authentic and realistic it is. I mean, I'm looking at NBC Circuit, Whoa, man, it's so realistic. Everything down to the, the K-rails, to the signage, the marks on the pavement, all the cars. I think if you look at the history of the Need for Speed franchise, you could see that it's actually grown with the tuner culture, and it not only mimics, but it is very much a part of it. Now, with looking at the Pro Street game, the types of tuners that are in the game have actually been influenced by the aftermarket culture, and the new people that are coming into this are going to be introduced to these tuners through the game, so it's very much a part of the tuner culture. Titling the game Pro Street, it has a very actual appropriate connotation for um, what, we're, what we're doing here. Not to be too cliche, but it, uh, you could say that you could take the uh, racer out of the street, but you can't take the street out of the racer. An entire industry was spawned from um, these, the street racing scene. This car would kick butt in Need for Speed. This car right here. Kick well, not only does it butt. kick butt, but I mean, you'd be happy seeing it do it too. I would be pretty happy. Yeah, you know, if you're any kind of a car fan or if you've played Need for Speed, you've seen this, you want it, you want to see it, but then you get to see that in reality on a racetrack and dicing it up with other cars that you've seen in video game, Vipers, Porsches, RX-7, I mean, we're living the dream. This is a video game come to life right here. We're living That's the dream. Thinking. Come out and enjoy it with us. I do think that this form of youth automotive culture is going to be the wave of the future. Now granted, we haven't had 50 years of experience out there to really you know, brand what we do and establish a following, but if you look at how fast it's happening, it's awesome. You know, in Europe, they're going crazy over it right now, and uh, in South America, New Zealand, Australia, Southeast Asia, 
it's here to stay, this type of racing, definitely. If I can help usher in the next generation of racers, tuners, builders, fans, that's what it's all about. I like to see those three disciplines at, at every event together. And just the whole culture as one all the time. Because if the whole culture is one all the time, we'll have strength unlike any other form of motorsports. I really feel that as the sport grows and lives, it's just gonna blow up and, and you know, th there's nothing like it and it's plain and simple, it's absolutely amazing. You know, I think they should turn drifting into WWF of motorsports. Give everybody a character. Make them come out and do backflips and wear a clown suit and go drift. It'll be entertaining, it'll be awesome. Ultimately, we want to create a culture that's here to stay forever. That means that we got to create good, honest racing that people want to watch and it's fair for everybody. And the culture will just keep growing all by itself then. I'm just really happy to be a part of this and this is what I want to do right now, so I'm doing it. I'm Tanner Faust and this is Need for Speed Pro Street. Need for Speed's Pro Need for Speed's Pro Street. A little tongue twister, okay. This is Chris Rado and this is the Need for Speed Street. Is that what you want to mention? And this is Need for Speed Pro Need for Speed. What is it? Need for Speed? What? Pro Street, right? Need for Street. Need Dude, you speak English is really not that hard. And this is the Need for Speed Pro Street. Like, hey, what's up? This is Antonio from Cypher Garage. This is Need for Speed Pro Street. Damn, Jesus. man, you're so American. Yep. See, I don't play video games. I don't know this. This is Need for Speed Pro Street. Drift you later.